thank everybody for uh, coming. I'm Ethan Rarick. I'm the director of the Robert T. Matsui Center for Politics and Public Service, part of the Institute of Governmental Studies uh, here on campus. The Matsui Center, as many of you know, is a living legacy to Robert T. Matsui, who uh, served in Congress for 25 years, representing the Sacramento area, and built a reputation in Congress and throughout California and across the nation for substantive policy achievement and for bipartisan uh, consensus building. The Matsui Center seeks to involve uh, Cal undergraduates in public service, interest them in public issues through a variety of programs offering internships, uh, offering public events, and bringing distinguished uh, public servants to campus. Uh, this is one example of that. This is actually our 10th Matsui Lectureship. Uh, the Matsui Lectureship brings former members of Congress to campus for residencies ranging from a couple of days up to a week, during which they can speak with students, speak to classes, uh, participate generally in the intellectual life of the campus, and most importantly for today's event, uh, deliver the Matsui Lecture. Um, this, this event continues the tradition of bringing extraordinary public servants to campus by bringing Senator Alan Simpson. Uh, in just a moment, you're gonna hear more about Senator Simpson, so I'm gonna leave most of the introduction to Congresswoman Matsui, uh, but I do wanna correct one error in the program that some eagle-eyed folks have spotted. We cut off 10 years of the Senator's distinguished service, which is a terrible crime against the nation, well, Senator. I apologize. <laughs> I apologize. We would have extended it 10 years if we could have. But the senator served until 1997, not 1987, as it says in the program, so my apologies. Um, but before we begin, uh, we are delighted that today we were able to be joined by Congresswoman Doris Matsui, who has now served 12 years in the House, building a reputation for leadership and policy achievements. Uh, she serves as a senior member of the House Energy and Commerce Committee and serves on the subcommittees for Health Communications and Technology, Environment and Digital Commerce and Consumer Protection. She is committed to strengthening flood protection and Lord knows after this past winter, we all know how important that is, uh, to ensuring quality affordable health care for all and to uh, promoting a clean energy economy. She's been a leader in Congress on promoting policies that address the effects of a changing climate serving as the co-chair of the Sustainable Energy and Environment Coalition. Thanks in large part to her efforts, the Sacramento region has been transforming into a clean tech capital with over 200 companies in the region. She's also a leader on technology and telecom policy and serves as co-chair of the Bipartisan Congressional High Tech Caucus. And she's an ardent supporter of STEM education, especially for women and girls. She was elected by her peers to serve as a co-chair of the Bipartisan Congressional Caucus for Women's issue, Issues, and she co-chaired the Democratic Women's Working Group. Now, somehow, in addition to doing all of that, she manages to be an, a, a stalwart supporter of the Matsui Center, offering us advice and guidance, connections to the many supporters that she and her husband have had through the years, uh, and whenever possible, coming to these events. We're fortunate that this week the House is out of session, so she could be here. I don't know if that's good for you. Maybe it is. You're back in sunny California, so that's perhaps a good thing. Um, but we are delighted that she could be here to make a few introductory remarks and introduce the Senator. Uh, then he and I will come back up, and, and he and I will be uh, uh, in conversation. And after a bit, we will be able also to take your questions. So, Congresswoman Matsui. Hi everyone, it's a delight for me to be back on campus. It's been a while, and coming down University uh, Boulevard, it just really brought back many, many memories. It was a wonderful time. Uh, I met my late husband here, so that really does bring up wonderful memories that I cherish forever. This is a um, special event for me because, not only because this is a Matsui lecture, but also because Ellen and Ann Simpson have been my friends for many, many years. Um, Senator Simpson was someone that came in to the Senate at the same time my husband went into the House. And I have to tell you that those days um, were much different than today. And, um, you know, the House and Senate, for the most part, got along, and we made friends across the House. And uh, we also had friends across the aisle. And... Um, Ellen and Ann Simpson are Republicans, and I'm a Democrat, and so is Bob. 
But we, in those days, got together an awful lot. We came from the same class. It came the same year. So I was a spouse at the time. So Anne and I got to know each other very, very well. And um, also the senator and Bob and all of us together um, formed a relationship and a friendship that lasts to today. And it's very, very special. And uh, we were remarking upon that just a little while ago that we wish that others could understand that when you do ha have friendships, you understand each other, you get to know each other on a personal level. And when you do that, you can understand where the person's coming from. And the policy making is, I won't say it's easy, but the fact of the matter is you can start at a place where you're not going to be calling each other ugly names. So, you know, I, I'm just delighted to be here. And it is something here with the uh, Matsui Lectures and the Matsui Center to, to promote a public life, public service. And certainly, Senator Simpson has exemplified that. He was an effective legislator in, uh, for the people of Wyoming for decades before he even came to Congress. And he really does embody the principles of a of principled, balanced leadership. And as scrappy as he is at times, you know, and I was just thinking that he sat on his microphone, I thought, oh, please don't swear, Alan, you know, because he really can do that, and really, he's from Wyoming, you understand? But he's a scrappy person who is so delightful. We've been on trips with them, and both of them are such fun. He served in the U.S. Senate as a member of the Republican leadership with integrity and was well liked by his colleagues on both sides of the aisle. And throughout his life, Senator Simpson has continued to be a trusted voice and advisor on issues ranging from foreign policy to fiscal reform. One of the famous things he did was uh, President Obama appointed Senator Simpson to co-chair the National Commission on Fiscal Responsibility and Reform, along with Erskine Bowles. So the Simpson Bowles, right? The Simpson Bowles come. Acronym. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs> but he did provide valuable common sense insight about how our government can work more efficiently and effectively. And I think we really need him today. I really feel you. I really wish you were back here today because I think someone like you and Erskine is really necessary for us to sort of see beyond some of the acrimony. Uh, we're honored to have him here. Um, he's a very special person. He tells it like it is, but with humor many times. And sometimes you're listening to him and you think, I can't believe what he said, but I'm still laughing and agreeing with him. So it is, it's a special honor for me to be here, to uh, be a part of this and to hear the discussion, because he is someone who absolutely exemplifies the best in citizenship. He never stops. He and Anne have always contributed wherever they are, wherever they are, and wherever they are in a sense of whether they're in Berkeley or in Wyoming, they travel around. Ellen Simpson and Anne Simpson are the best representatives of what is best in our country. So thank you very much, Alan and Anne, for being here. All right. Well, I, I want to <laughs> echo uh, Congresswoman Natsui's thanks for your being here all week long. I, I, do, I don't know what you're talking about when you say he could swear. I've been with him all week. I haven't heard that once. So I, I can't imagine. He always pulls his punches. Uh, thank you for being here. We're happy to it's have you. It's been a great week. And we're going to work you again tomorrow. So as, as you said earlier, they're working me like a pack horse. You said earlier. I did street. say that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I think something that the Congresswoman said in her uh, introduction is, a, is a, a good place to begin because she talked about the degree to which uh, members of Congress and other people in public service used to get along in a lot of ways better than they do now across party lines. And I've noticed throughout the week, as, as you and I have been talking, you've been speaking with students, um, you are famously candid, you're a, fam you're a person of strong beliefs, you are a Republican. But you talk about your relationships with Democrats, people you disagreed with, your ability to work with them. Uh, Secretary Reich comes to mind, now on our faculty, your great friend. When I asked you the other day who's 
one of the best legislators you've ever seen. You mentioned Ted Kennedy. So talk about how you managed to cling to your own beliefs or stick to your own beliefs and yet at the same time reach across the aisle to people you disagreed with and work with them and get things done. Well, first, let me thank uh, this lovely gal. Uh, and Bob and Doris came. And uh, I think we went to a White House dinner together or something. And then we worked together on things. And I remember the reparations bill particularly. Uh, he was the driver in the House, he and Norm Mineta. And then they handed the ball over to us in the Senate. And I was one of the drivers over there on the reparations <coughs> bill because Hart Mountain, Wyoming, was right next to to my town. Uh, it was one of the 10 camps of the relocation centers. There were 10 in America where over 140,000 Japanese Americans were taken. 11,000 of them or 14,000 went to Hart Mountain and that's where I met Norm Mineta. He was behind Boyer and I was living in Cody. Another interesting story. but. But Bob and Doris and, and we, we all, we met, we talked to each other. Uh, the electronic curse had not arrived yet. <laughs> Where you walk down the street and, <laughs> and trip over people and all the rest of it goes with that. Uh, but you, 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 you arrived at friendship. Uh, that's what it has gone. And a large part of that is caused by fundraising. And a large part of that, now even worse, is the Citizens United case. That's a disaster. Uh, it, it, the First Amendment was the only amendment put on the books for a person. And the reason they put it on the books is because they never let the media within 100 yards of the building when they were crafting this amazing document. And they said, what are we going to do now? We've irritated them pretty bad. Well, we'll give the First Amendment to take care of a guy cranking out seditious literature in a basement in Philadelphia. Goes for the person. And then comes the Supreme Court and calls corporate personhood. This is absolutely absurd. So now I'm working with another cause, Doris. It's called the 28th Amendment. And it's moving around, Democrats and Republicans. And what it essentially does, it doesn't touch the First Amendment, but it gives the states the full authority to do what you want with campaign finance reform instead of a $5 million cat or a $10 million cat just laying it out and nobody knows who's doing it. So that was a big cause. But it's like Ted Kennedy. Uh, I didn't care what he did. Uh, I have not been the judge of men and women. Uh, no one gave me that title, uh, what he did. But all I knew is, is when we worked together, and we did a lot, a lot of things, especially immigration, when he shook my hand and said, I'm with you or I'm not, he never broke his word with me. And that's all I care about. It has nothing to do with anything. But nowadays, oh. <laughs> <laughs> On our commission, people s knew that we were crazy because we hit everybody. <laughs> a 67-page report in English using words like going broke and a shared sacrifice. Shared sacrifice is the laugher of the century. There's never been any since World War II, period. So they finally, looking at these squirrels, say, well, who voted for it? Well, uh, Dick Durbin of Illinois. Dick Durbin of Illinois, that commie guy from Illinois, for the <laughs> God's sake. Well, uh, Tom Coburn voted. Tom Coburn, that Neanderthal Republican from Oklahoma? That's your country right now. You just nail a guy and say, this is so-and-so, and he's a Democrat, or he's a fink, or he's a progressive, or he's a neo-whatever. Watch out for anybody using neo in front of anything, because uh, nobody knows what the hell it means. And a paradigm is 20 cents. <laughs> so, uh, the, and there's no humor. If you use humor, you're an idiot. Uh, and the fun of having humor, there's guys in this room who have plenty of it, colleagues and people I enjoy. This is my old ROTC buddy from Cal right here, and we served in the, in the armored infantry in Germany and in the 2nd Armored Division Hell on Wheels, Charlie Ray. There he is, lurking. 
here. Uh, but we, uh, we, had, uh, we had friendship, and we had integrity, and we had trust. Uh, the, the coin of the realm is trust. Now you don't even have trust in your own party. You guys got cut in your bicycle tire who, who, were, who were right there in your caucus uh, trying to throw you out or whatever you're trying to do. And it is, uh, I've always said, if you have integrity, nothing else matters. And if you don't have integrity, nothing else matters. How, and that's it. How did, so you mentioned, I'm curious how you think we sort of lost that era of trust and friendship in Congress and in public leadership. Um, you mentioned constant fundraising as one source of that. Um, is there also just an issue of the fact that members of Congress used to move to Washington, used to their children went to school in Washington. Now they just don't get to know each other. Is, that, is, is the lack of friendship, does that lead to lack of function? Oh yes, without question. Uh, I came into the Senate with a class of 20. That was the largest class in the history of the U.S. Senate as far as I no. 20 new people, there were 11 Republicans and nine Democrats. It was people like Bill Bradley, Nancy Kassebaum, David Pryor, uh, you know, uh, Bill Cohen, just a wonderful group of people. And we used to get together on weekends and have picnics. And we used to meet once a month. The Democrats would pick the speaker Carl Levin picked the, the guy head of the United Auto Workers. I picked somebody, and Nancy would, and, and Baker and Byrd, the two leaders, who were both wonderful leaders, they came in one day and they said, what are you doing in here? <laughs> and we said, meeting. <laughs> they said, about what? <laughs> well, principally, how the hell to answer the mail. <laughs> and how to deal with the jerk mail from jerks, real jerks. <laughs> And that kind of thing, and, and it, it dissembled because we all got busy, and as Doris knows, you, your life is chaos. And you have to have an amiable companion, and you have to have the softening agents of life, of music and art and books and theater, because if all you want is politics, it's barbaric. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, we, we had, we, we functioned together, we went to plays, uh, in Washington, in the National Theater, it was it was just it was friendship, and there is even if you wanted to do it, your staff would prevent you now. <laughs> your staff would say, "I'm sorry, you don't have time to have this cozy little dinner because there are six people coming in, and they all maxed out in your last campaign." You say, "I don't give a well, you do because you <laughs> you like their money." <laughs> And why are they giving to me for access? They're not giving to me for charity. And the poor guy that wants to put in five bucks, he just throws it away. He said, this is no good. Somebody loaned him or gave him two million bucks. And so your staff, don't forget the power of staff. It's awesome and, and it's overwhelming and it's not good because they have come out of a partisan campaign and they don't like the other people. They don't like Democrats because they're evil. They don't like Republicans, and they're hardened. And then suddenly they have a job which really requires coordination and cooperation. And they say, to hell with that guy, you know. Or what kind of an amendment is that? We'll take that one and use it ourselves. I mean, the, the, there's too many staff, and, uh, and uh, it's, it's not a good thing. And, but they're, they're, they're not responsible to to compromise and consideration. They, they're, they're politicians and they want, to, they want to hurt, they want to win, and you win at any cost, and then after you've won, you stay there at any cost. And We see it, Erskine and I have seen it, all of us have seen it, and we would go up to people after we did our work, and they had a little badge said Congress, and they'd say, save us from ourselves. <laughs> So they ain't about to make a tough call because if they do, their base will tear them to bits. So if you're a Democrat and you say, I think we ought to be talking about entitlement reform and Social Security reform, they say, 
Al, we have a primary opponent for you, Bonehead. <laughs> and if you're a Republican and you start talking about, you know, anything that has to do with social issues and trying to get a balance on something and say, you know, we have a primary opponent wired and ready for you. So that is part of the sourness of it all, and it's tough to watch. But you had the ability to kind of overcome that. You've, you've talked about your friendship with Secretary Reich starting despite the fact that your staffs told you not to get together, mm -hmm. right? That's right. Talk about that a little bit, because I think that's an well, illustrative story. I met Bob Reich at one of those interminable black tie dinners in Washington. <laughs> You're supposed to look alive, but actually you're dead. And uh, <laughs> so you're, you're sitting there, and the evening goes on, and the tragedy is that the MC is drinking, and the guest is drinking, and they're telling stories. Remember that night in Chicago? Oh, yeah, yeah. Wasn't that fun? And we say, how did it get out of this? <laughs> so it, there was a, a break, and Reich walked up, and I, I looked down, and <laughs> <laughs> I said, I said, you're, he said, I'm Bob Reich, uh, Bob Reich, uh, quick witted guy, wonderful. And then he just got out of the way and he pulled over a chair and jumped on the chair. <laughs> <laughs> and then he got right up and I said, well, this is amazing. What, what are you up to? Secretary of Labor. I said, oh, I'll be damned. <laughs> and uh, so uh, we talked and, and, and started telling some limericks and some jokes that were pretty bad. And so he, uh, he told his staff, he said, uh, I'm going to go over to Simpson's office uh, at noon and have a sandwich with him. And they said, no, no, no. Simpson is a nut. <laughs> Simpson is a Republican nut. He's from a right-to-work state. And you're the Secretary of Labor, for God's sake? They don't even know what union people are out there. <laughs> on and on. And he said, I don't give a damn about that. I'm going to do that. So when, then the next couple of months, I said, I'm going over to Bob Reich. Oh, God, Bob Reich is a commie. You don't <laughs> want to go to Bob Reich. He's a, he's, he, he's a socialist. He isn't even a Democrat. Well, that's part of the staff issue that I'm talking about. Uh, one day I was told I had, Moynihan was a great man, Senator Moynihan of, of New York. He had a view that you, everyone's entitled to their own opinion, but no one is entitled to their own facts. Isn't that a sick idea? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so he, uh, he told me he, he, that he said, uh, you know, we'll, uh, it was something, and my staff said, you know, this bill, the one bill you're working on, Moynihan doesn't agree with this amendment here, and I wouldn't even bring it up because he, he'll kill it. They were in the majority then. So I saw Moynihan at a roll call vote. I said, Pat, what, what, what's, what's this opposition? You and I have talked about this. He said, what are you talking about? Well, I said, your staff told my staff. Oh, he said, that's crap. <laughs> there again, the staff doing the work. All of them want to be king, you know. You don't want to forget that part. And so you had to work through that terrible, abysmal staff control because they know you're working on 800 issues and they're only working on three or four or five, and they're the driver. So it, it, it makes it tough. I didn't answer your question, but I got a lot off my chest on that. <laughs> so, good. And, so. so one of the things that I was struck with to, to move from staff to the actual office holders. I was looking at the roster of the Senate when you first went to the Senate last night in 1979, when you first arrived in the Senate. I was struck by how divergent the parties were. There were still lots of liberal Republicans, Jacob Javits, Mac Mathias, you mentioned Bill Cohen, um, Lowell Weicker was in the Senate. There were lots of conservative Democrats, particularly in the South, but elsewhere as well. Um, now the parties have sorted out into ideological camps where the most conservative Democrat is more liberal than the most liberal Republican and vice versa. I'm curious, how, how much do you think the, the, the old style of parties, the old style of caucus that you had, where you had divergent views within your own party, how much did that actually help the system to work by encouraging compromise within the party and then between the two parties? 
Well, when I came to the Senate, I mean, I'm looking at iconic figures, at least to me, uh, who, who loved to study. My dad had been a senator, U.S. senator, and governor. So that's led me into it. But I get there, and here's Abe Ribicoff of Connecticut. I mean, he was a classy, classy guy. Jack Javits of New York, Russell Long of Louisiana, Mark Hatfield of Oregon. These were dramatic figures. Uh, uh, and uh, so you were kind of awed by them. And then uh, we had in our party, and then I became the assistant leader, which meant that I was kind of in charge of gathering up the votes. Well, uh, I just knew that there were five guys who weren't often going to be with us, whether we were in the majority or the minority, and I could name them. Stafford, who was a great guy from Vermont, I think. There was Lowell Weicker, ornery, rascal, a good guy, <laughs> terribly ornery. And uh, there was, as you named, uh, there was uh, 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 well, Stafford. Uh, well, Chafee was always there in one way, and I don't, you don't need to go into the names. But we knew we had to get through all of those guys, and sometimes we couldn't. And it started when I remember Mark Hatfield would not vote for the defense budget. This is a serious issue. It means you're a commie. <laughs> uh, you have, and don't forget how the defense budget works, ladies and gentlemen. The Republicans you see are the defenders of the earth. So they would add five billion over in the, and, and finally Nancy Pelosi figured that out. She said, add five billion here and send it back so that we don't become the evil people who hate protecting our country. And this budget is so bloated in defense you can't even imagine. And Erskine and I picked it apart. Woodward picked it apart a few days ago or a few weeks ago and got hammered flat. 150 billion in excess. You haven't seen anything. So you, you get an issue like that and so Mark wouldn't vote for it. And I'll name the name, Santorum of Pennsylvania got up and said, I think you should be driven out of the party. How's this for brains? I mean, you really got to use your head for this. And he, was a, he ran for president of the United States, Santorum. He's the one that said on the floor of the Senate that gays and lesbians did animals. How's that for a sweetheart in your own party? <laughs> Well, enough of that, but you have to get down to the bottom of these things. And so uh, Mark got up and he said, wait a minute, uh, young man. I was in the U.S. Navy for four years or eight, steaming to Japan. And I was the first, first group of Americans to arrive at Hiroshima. And I vowed right then that I would never vote for anything that had to do with war or defense. And that's how I earned my uh, activities. You may not like that, boy, I tell you, there wasn't a, wasn't a sound in that room. And uh, so, you know, you, you, once you got to know people and, and their pain and their feelings and their sensitivities, it was easy to work with them. Nowadays, you wouldn't have any idea what was in the heart and mind or the or the you know the background of somebody just because he or she is a damn democrat or a damn republican and it's very sad and it's not going to change at least in my time because of of the overwhelming electronic influence added to that insensitivity so uh hang on tight there will be a tipping point at some point what will, what will bring that tipping point? How do, how do we the try to get to, to, the economy. to get the point of fixing that? When you have people in Congress and 90% of them don't know the difference between a balance sheet and a profit and loss statement, you got problems in River City. And they don't know what that is because they've been working in their lives and they're hard working people and they don't have time and they've always thought of politics and, and you don't have time to, to learn. So. When, when Erskine and I finished our work, and I'll get the answer, I haven't, had, I haven't heard Ann clear her throat yet, and then when that comes, <laughs> she's, she's sitting right here. There she is, 63 years come June 21st. There she is. <laughs> now, where was I? Yeah, 
yes, uh, <laughs> I get diverted with her. Uh, the uh, the when we when we were doing our work and uh, and uh, the uh, what the hell was it? I was, mu you, was you mumbling talk, into the vapors. Talk about Bowl, the Simpson oh, Bowles Commission, yeah. not the Bowles Simpson Commission. Simpson no, Bowles don't Commission. Don't call it that. Yeah. Well, because uh, I want to get to your answer through this circuitous, Balance unbelievable. Yeah. And so, when we would were doing our work, we would we would try to tell people what they had to know that there's a difference between the deficit and the debt. <laughs> <laughs> well, the the deficit when we came there and did our work was one trillion four, which is one trillion four hundred billion. It then began to go down, and it did go down, and it went down for many reasons. Can't limit. I can't tell them all. Probably got to about 500 billion, but the debt is on automatic pilot. The deficit doesn't have anything to do. The debt is on automatic pilot because of the entitlement programs and Social Security. I don't. You can start throwing things if you wish, but don't give me. Emotion, fear, guilt, or racism. This is how you pass or kill a bill in the U.S. Senate or Congress. You use a deft blend of emotion, fear, guilt, or racism. And the only way you win is to do your homework and work your butt off and work and do and prepare and prepare and prepare so you can beat back those who are using that because people who use that are not using their brain. They're using emotion. And that works. Flash words work. Amnesty. Oh, God, amnesty. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, cutting Social Security. What cuts Social Security for the poorest people in the world? The entitlements program. What? And so, you know, a guy could buy this place here and gets a hard operation for 200 grand, doesn't even get a bill. Give me a break. Don't forget how this works. You don't have to, you don't have to check your checkbook. And you're over 65 and you just shoot the works. Or you can get into the defense budget and you can be a military retiree and they have a program called TRICARE. Premium is 560 bucks a year. Eight, $12 copay. Costs 51 billion a year for, you know, two and a half million people. You can't talk about this. You then are called a commie. You hate veterans. You hate. And when we did our work with the plan, we didn't touch SSI. We didn't touch. We didn't touch food stamps. And you'd think, oh my God, what have they done? So, all you know is the tipping point. The tipping point is when this thing reaches 20 trillion bucks at the end of this decade, and the deficit is going up and will not go down. From now on, it's hang on tight because 10,000 people a day are turning 65. Mm -hmm. And when I was in college, I uh, had uh, weighed 260, had hair and thought beer was food. <laughs> I, there were 16 people paying into the system and one taking out. Today there are three people paying into the system and one taking out. And in 10 years, there will be two people paying in and one taking out. What that young man puts in today, I get next month. There is no lock box. If anybody tells you a lock box, take a key and get into their box because they have no brain in there. But you can't talk like this. You see, you hate seniors. Oh, how can you hate seniors? Well, I'll tell you. I met with the AARP a few weeks ago and I said, please tell me your mission in perfect English. And this guy who has five children under 15, he said, our mission is to protect people over 50. I said, is that it? He said, that's it. I said, how about the young people of this country? How about your five kids? How about your grandchildren? Where are you? Where, where's, where's your compassion? Well. You see, seniors are all hurting. I said, well, they're not all eating out of a garbage can in an alley, I can tell you that. That won't get you anywhere either. So we, we said, 
we, what we would do with, with that. And the tipping point comes when we hit 20 trillion bucks and the people who have loaned us the money say, hey, we got you figured out. You're, you have a dysfunctional government and you're addicted to debt and we want more money for our money. And at that point, inflation will kick in more, not much now, and interest rates will not stay at 2%. Interest rates will go where the hell they've always gone. Five, six, hopefully no higher than that. And then, and then we'll be paying, instead of 240 billion a year in interest, we'll be paying 700 billion in interest. And it all comes off of discretionary, which is what you love. Education, infrastructure, defense, all those things are gonna be crowded out by the failure to do something with the entitlement program and social security solvency. Now you, and so the tipping point then after inflation and interest, guess who gets screwed? The little guy that everybody talks about all day and all night, get your violin out. <laughs> I'm just here for the little guy. You know, give me a break because the rich guys always take care of themselves. They always have. In every society, they always will. And I'm a Republican. I mean, you know, I shouldn't be talking like this. <laughs> but uh, kind of sad. So that's the tipping point. And, uh, and then let me just speak of Social Security, because I hope there, there are young people here. This is a great system started by Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was one of the great civil libertarians of our time. He, he said, we're going to do something. We have to do something. A ditch digger can't make it. So they did the Social Security system, which was to give 43% re, you know, replacement rate to what you made. I promise it's less than three minutes. And so they did it. And it was great because mortality was 62 and you retired at 65. Now you can't beat that. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can't beat that anywhere. There's no, nowhere at all. So, there it is. And today, the, the age is 80. That's, that's the age of, of it. <laughs> and, and, and you can now still retire at 62. And uh, so we said this is impossible and we'd rather go down in flames to let the ARP tear our underwear off. We'll just do it anyway. Uh, so we said we'll give the lowest 100, the lowest 125 percent, uh, lowest poverty, give them 125 percent of poverty. That'll cost. We're going to change the the wages subject to the tax instead of 108 thousand. You got it. You come up to 200. You could go higher. Some suggested taking it off, but we had one marvelous patriot testify that if we took that off all the way, and he was making three million a year, he would. He would not work as hard. <laughs> <laughs> and we said, you, sir, are the patriot of the year. <laughs> you phony son of a bitch. Oh, yeah. So, uh, so uh, then we said, we're going to change the bend points. That's inside baseball, but it works. And go to the chain CPI. Now, let me tell you, the president, President Obama, was with us on that, and he said we need to change the cost of living index to the chain CPI. Don't go into it too deeply, but it's a more adroit or current way of inflation as to your benefit. And they tore him to bits and us along with him. How could anyone talk about a savagery of taking the, changing the CPI, the, kept the precious, well, so then we said, well, we'll do another thing for sure that'll work. We'll change the retirement age to 68 by the year 2050. Now, don't forget, it's going to be 67. It's going to change. It's going to go to, you know, uh, in 1927, you're, it's going to be 67 years. That's already on the books. People don't know that either. And so they said 50 years. 
60, oh, this is cruel. How do you do this? To, how can you do that to people? You say, well, it's 2017 now. We think that with their brains somehow functioning, that they will figure how to prepare for a 68 at 2050. Boy, you can get your shorts ripped off on that one. And, uh, so, and the entitlements programs, we said, you're going to have to do something there. And you, these programs cannot exist. They're unsustainable right now. I'm going to shut up, but I shouldn't. But, I, but I, just let me tell you the rest. of The Social Security system, by doing nothing, you're going to waddle up to the window in 2034 and get a check for 23% less. Who is telling us this? Some nut Republican or some goofy Democrat? No, the trustees of the system are telling us that. And they're telling us that the Medicare will, quote, go broke. They don't go broke, they just go down about 13%. That's Medicare trust fund. And that goes out in 2038. The highway trust fund will go into the tank in 20, you know, 15 years. And the disability insurance fund, which is so overused and gimmick that you can't even think about it, is going to go down the tube in five years. And uh, I'm sure there are some in this room who say, you, sir, are an assassin. <laughs> but I tell you why I win. I don't care whether I, anybody cares that I win, because at 85, I've achieved life's ultimate goal. I've pissed off everyone in America. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody had to do that. And Erskine and I decided we would do that. But most of the recommendations of the commission have, in fact, not been implemented. Do you have much hope that, that these issues will be addressed in a way that you think will, will uh, resolve them? They will because of the nature of the human beast. Uh, because when your congressperson comes to your district, a senator, and says, I know this is a problem, just telling your constituents like, I know it's a problem, and I know we can get it done, and I am going to get it done, but we're going to do it without touching precious Medicare, precious Medicaid, precious Social Security, and precious defense. <laughs> now, as educated people, then you want to, somebody should say in the back, you, sir, are giving a terminological inexactitude. You lying son of a bitch. <laughs> now that's exactly where we are. There is no way to explain it any further. They'll fog you, and they can't do it unless you do it. And the tragedy of it is, with a Republican Senate, a Republican House, a Republican President doing a budget, which is the phoniest, baloniest thing I have, I saw. They were all phony baloney. Every president gave you a phony baloney budget. Didn't have real figures. It was romance language. And so you have this situation where we're not dealing in that budget with two-thirds of the American budget, which is health care and the solvency of Social Security. Two-thirds is unaddressed. They're talking about Big Bird and Little Bird and Turd Bird, whatever they are, all of them. Madness. NPR, these things uh, are, are, are stupefying. So this is the tax let me, let me. Oh, the tax. Oh, there, now wait, that's a good, this man has asked the best question. Do you think they're going to do tax reform? Listen, this, uh, this guy may be a plant. Now, wait, wait, no, no, listen to this. Because it's important. You were going to get to that. This is an extra quarter. <laughs> I've been with him. The tax code. This is the next thing on the agenda. If anybody believes that that will change, the drinks are on me. <laughs> because here's what it is. Now, don't miss this. Erskine and I dug into this thing. The tax code is, has 180 plus things in it called tax expenditures. They are loopholes, gimmicks, trash, and they're powerfully, powerfully intimate to many people. Like, are you talking about home mortgage interest? Oh, God, you don't mean, no. We just said, we don't think you need a million bucks for a second home. We'll, we'll give everybody 500 
thousand and then give a twelve and a half percent tax credit which would help the little guy. Well, I don't know, that's terrible to take away, you know, the real estate, everything will collapse, you know, there won't be anything left. Well, a home, a home mortgage, a charitable du deduction, what, what were you saying there? And you, you have to do something good with that. Uh, and then home, municipal bond interest, ooh, that would wipe me out. I, well, good, we don't want to do that. But we did think we'd deal with 180 loopholes that are appalling, and guess what? Only 20% of the American people use 80% of the tax code. Don't miss this. Only 25% of the American people itemize, which means 75% don't even know what's in the tax code. And then you get to things like Part B premiums on Medicare, where the beneficiary is paying about 35%, and the guys in the kitchen down here are paying the other 65. Is that America? Not in my mind. This is gimmickry of the first order, and you won't change a bit because I say to people, who are you people in the audience that are benefiting under the tax code and every single person has to have their hand up? If they got a brain and an accountant, <laughs> and the knowledge of the tax code, which is what exemptions, what tax expenditures will help me the most. Parking for employees, employer deduction of the health care for employees, you name it. And you ought to get a list of them because you you're, pop your eyes. And you're never going to get that, you're never going to get that out of the hands of the people who get it because the people who have it are the people who control the works. So I want to shift gears a little bit and ask you about some very contemporary politics. We've been talking a while, and one word we have not said is Trump. <laughs> <laughs> so, you so, so as a Republican, uh, yeah. uh, uh, tell me what you think about the new Republican president's performance so far and what you think about the prospect for his presidency going forward. Now, when I was uh, in the Army, I had an 81 millimeter mortar platoon, and I can't hear anything. <laughs> <laughs> but I was, now, you remember, Charlie, I had that. Now, sometimes, no, no, sometimes no, I, this I, week, I know you didn't hear questions. This I, time, I think you heard my question. <laughs> I'm not going to buy that You one. were a good interpreter. <laughs> You've been a good, good, good fellow. Well, obviously, uh, I did not vote for Trump. Uh, you don't need to put obviously there. I voted for Jeb Bush, but that was a lost cause, and I knew that, and Ann voted for me. So we feel, <laughs> we feel that we, we did a great thing there. But let me tell you something. Uh, I see people who are so hostile and so frustrated and angered and passionate and frothing at the mouth uh, who, about Trump. And I say, well, let me give you the words of a person who should feel much more frustrated, tangled up, torn to bitch, angry, hostile, ferocious than any of you people in this room. And her name was Hillary Clinton. And she said, quote, he is the president. Let's keep an open mind and give him a chance. So don't cry all over my shoes about Trumpy babe. And now evil and snot, son of a bit rotten duck. <laughs> but just remember, he's hated by the media because he hates the media. Well, one thing you don't want to have people hate you is the media. There isn't a thing you're going to read about him. It will be the worst hundred days in, in, since, the, since the world began. And he's done some goofy things, some erratic things, and he'll do more. But he is not an ideologue, which makes him an interesting, dangerous fellow, because at some point, he's going to do something you really like. Because you can't peg him. He was a Democrat. He contributed to Clinton's campaign. He's all over the map. He's for gay lesbians, and then he's not. And he's pro-abortion, then he's not. And so. Just hang on tight, but don't play the game of 100 days with, with a guy who, 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 who can't possibly score on any kind of screen, uh, especially the New York Times, or, and I read the New York Times. I don't think they're a commie outfit. A lot of people think that. I don't. Read The Economist and This Week, and, 
And don't stick with your favorite television program where you can sit there thrilled to the core and tingling and almost wetting your drawer as do it. your guy <laughs> is tearing somebody to bits. And you say, God, isn't that something? I love it. <laughs> and so you need to get work uh, and uh, <laughs> turn off your set and try to, or even do something else, turn on the other set for a minute, even though you're quivering and you can't quite handle it. But now, I'm being a smart aleck now, and there's a fine line between good humor and smart ass, and I've crossed it many times. <laughs> I don't know what he's going to do, but I'll tell you, let me tell you one incident of how it happens to work with a different guy. Ronald Ray, we were at a, I think, I think Bob went to one of these. It was a, it was a stag, it was a, a nut fry. Won't go any further than that, but at the harvest of lambs, in the spring you have these marvelous missiles and they are like a Vienna sausage. And they're delicious. <laughs> Nobody knows what a Vienna sausage is anymore, <laughs> but you deep fat fry them and put them in soup and the Basques know how to cook them. And Reagan never missed it, he loved it. Came in one night with his brown suit on. He said, guys, sorry to be late, I just put a 2,000 pound bomb in Gaddafi's window in Libya. Maybe you've forgotten that. We said, what? <laughs> he said, yeah, it took a little extra time, but uh, they had to get back from there and the friends wouldn't let them fly back or over, so they had to go. I mean, this is at the dinner, just a bunch, 60 or 80 guys. And you know what happened? Uh, we didn't hear from Gaddafi again until the last administration was said, better get rid of Gaddafi. Without thinking, just like when you get rid of Saddam Hussein, what are you going to do when they're gone? Right. Okay. And so Gaddafi's land of Libya is just chaos. And so is Iraq. So is the health care plan because you have seven years of voting to kill it <laughs> and never had the brain power to put together a replacement, <laughs> which has got to be called Disney World in every sense. <laughs> you had seven, seven years to concoct anything. I mean, just a concept of, of replacing and nothing. So they're going to take their lumps. And, uh, but I think when he laid, he laid a little hardware on that uh, airfield in Syria, I liked that. I'm a military guy. We were not, we were not in the military to, to work with mayors and give out candy. We were trained to kill the sole function of our military training was to kill somebody. And we didn't have to do that, and that was great. And I wasn't in combat, we weren't in combat. But for God's sake, uh, I don't know where that's going. They say, well, well what, what will happen now? I said, I don't know. But I'll bet you they know there's a new sheriff in town. Uh, and my experience with Obama, and this is not a partisan thing, this is an observing thing. He pointed me. All of the ones I served with, Carter, Bush, Reagan, and Clinton, I really enjoyed them all, and I did. Great guys, great humor, I got to know them. And all of them figuratively could say, ready, aim, fire, and make a decision. With Obama, President Obama, it was ready, aim, 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 and never do what had to be done, at least in the thought of most people, maybe, not Republicans. And he, I don't think he wanted to offend anyone, which is a problem because if you if you, if you think you can get through life uh, without offending people, that's a feckless cause. Uh, and then I think political correctness is a disaster. I think political correctness is like wearing duct tape over your mouth, because if you really say, I don't believe I've ever had an ugly thought, <laughs> uh, I don't believe I've ever been biased about anything or prejudiced or hopefully not ever think of such a thing. Let me tell you, that's a fake. Because if you're alive, you have. 
but it's how you handle it. That's how you do it. And I think half the rage in the world is people who are so absorbed that but this stuff is like a fissure in a volcano, and it will come out. It will come out in rage, or it will come out in something, or hostility that you can cover it with. I hate this. A hatred corrodes the container it's carried in. Just don't forget that one. Hatred corrodes the container it's carried in. You end up having gas, ulcers, B.O., and heartburn, and you're in the shower hating this son of a bitch, and he's golfing. Who's the sick one? <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm going to quit. I don't, God, I'm glad to get that out, but I don't know where we're. Where, where, now, where, oh. you, you, you mentioned uh, a minute ago yeah. both uh, gay and lesbian rights in the New York Times, which leads into another question, since you published an op-ed in the New York Times a few weeks ago encouraging... <laughs> President Trump, we're talking about President Trump, encouraging President Trump to embrace an openness toward gay rights. And uh, I think by extension, criticizing your own party for a social conservatism that, um, that you often don't agree with. Is that a kind of threat to your own party that, that uh, there's a social conservatism that will, that will hurt your party down the road? Uh, I think that's true if you continue to use the stereotype. It's like the stereotype of Berkeley. Let me tell you, I've been here a week and I've met some of the finest young people that I have ever met. And they're open and they want to talk and they ask great questions. But the stereotype is, you're not going to Berkeley, Simpson. <laughs> They'll cut your tires on your car and, and you're a Republican from Wyoming, you're doomed. <laughs> and besides that, they're killing people and beating people up in the street. They don't def differentiate a bunch of guys who are anarchists wearing black with some college kid that has an honest bitch. No. So if you want to stereotype, there are plenty of us in the, in the Senate. There was Nancy Kassebaum, Hank Brown. There were a lot of us who were pro-choice and, and never got beat. And, but the stereotype is that they're all homophobes and, the, and, you know, and they hate that they all say, well, I love the gay lesbian community. It's just what they do. <laughs> which is another nice little slice of crap, but anyway. <laughs> so I did get into it. I had a cousin who was a war hero, World War II, and a medic, Silver Star. He was gay. We didn't know that. In those days, he had to marry because back in the 40s and 50s, you didn't dare think of being out, I can tell you that. So he married, and then he had his life, good life, my cousin, another cousin, was lesbian, and she taught school in, in Downers Grove, Illinois. I've always believed a simple thing, that we're all God's children. And I wrote to Reverend Phelps. He's a marvelous man. He said that the reason we were losing veterans in Vietnam is because we embraced queers in America. He's a wonderful man. I wrote him a letter. I said, Dear Reverend Phelps, I know of your good work. And I just want you to know that some dizzy son of a bitch is sending me the stupidest letters and signing your name. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I, 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 hope, I hope that you will help me find him and track him down and wipe him out. And I know you will help. Yours in, yours in God. <laughs> But uh, it's funny, but it's not funny. But uh, you, you uh, were all human beings. And how could I ever know the pain of somebody in that situation? I can't. But I know one thing. I can sure tell my side of it. And I told him in that letter, I said, better check with your vice president. He did something like the religious exemption in Indiana, and they chopped him up. They had to go into a separate session to change that. Uh, there's nothing wrong with religion and religious exceptions, but it's just like the Civil Rights Act. Why should I not do what I want to in my own cafe? Well, the only reason it is that the only reason you did it, there wasn't a black guy that ever was allowed in the door. So you go over the top of that stuff. And the religious exemption is a beautiful way, and the courts will toss it down like they did, and then they'll do it again. I don't know where it's going, but I do know that, that 
I can't even tell you the sea change on gay lesbians uh, from the time I was in high school when Jimmy March was a, a queer. You knew that. He just kind of the way he was. And he went home at lunch one day and blew his head off. And I thought, that doesn't seem right to me. And uh, that's what they did, you know, in those days. You just made fun of people and called them queer. Those days are gone forever. It's a sea change. And young people, they don't give a damn. It's the guys with gray in their hair that will give you a rag on gay lesbian issues. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't. <laughs> but the young people, they, they're more accepting. They're more accepting on race, religion, gay lesbian issues, abortion. Who's, who's for abortion? You ever seen a sign that says, have an abortion? They're just really, really great. No. They, they are a deeply intimate and personal decision. And I don't think men legislators should even vote on it. How does a man legislator who's drank scotch watching porn movies is into this, <laughs> is into this game about abortion? Give me a break. I get in a lot of trouble on that one, too. <laughs> but I don't know what you're talking about. Trouble? No. Don't forget, this guy is an ink-stained wreck. <laughs> I'm he a recovering ink-stained wreck, He's a journalist, wreck, Senator. and that's why I don't know what he's going to ask, but it'll be another ringer. What is it you, now? Well, you, yeah. <laughs> Now, you told me not to tell you what I was going to ask did. you. You I insisted that I, I did. not tell I you did. that. I did. I did. I never right. should have, but I did. Well, now, if you think my <laughs> questions are, are, are <laughs> tough, in a minute we're going to go to audience questions, and then you're going to get some, some uh, then, then they'll you, really stick you. But you. Let me ask did you, you one salt more. the audience? No, I did not. No, I did not. I don't know, I don't know what they're going to ask you. To. But let me ask you one more thing, and then we'll go to their question. So I want to ask one other political question, which is we talked a lot about Republicans and how the Republican Party is doing and so forth. But um, I'm also curious... How does the Democratic Party become more competitive in large parts of the country where, frankly, it is not competitive right now, including places like Wyoming, places across the South? Um, we just saw an election where Hillary Clinton won the popular presidential vote, but really only because of California, lost it in the rest of the country. Um, how does the Democratic Party revive itself, say, in Wyoming or elsewhere? Well, the Democratic Party, as, as I knew it, was the party of the working person. A party of the work, the, the lunch bucket crowd. Uh, and, and then how do you become the party and stay the party of the lunch bucket crowd when you have people trying to stop every type of form of something that affects business? No more coal mines, no more fracking, Watch out when you build a bridge. You've got to go through eight years of crap just to build a bridge because of the regulations. And finally, the working man ain't working. And he or she in that, in that rust belt, I, I do think it's a tragic mistake to try to tear down trade agreements. I just don't see that at all, but that's where they're going. Uh, and I think that's a, a, a bad scene. But uh, the union members seem to think that that's good to get rid of that, I guess, trade agreements, but I think they may, but the point is, they didn't become the party or stay the party of the working man, they became the party of the greenies and the people who were limiting what you could do, limiting this industry, uh, OSHA, this, regulation, control, uh, protecting the preble mouse uh, in Wyoming, the preble jumping mouse, may not be around in a few years because it has subspecies that still jump. And maybe they won't need to have the one, they could have the subspecies. I mean, and here's another sick one for you. Rich Trumka of the AFL-CIO is a great friend of mine. I just talked to him the other day, got a great sense of humor, wonderful guy. I'm from a right-to-work state, he's the head of the and he tried to tell Obama, build the Keystone Pipeline, for God's sake. Uh, people come to Wyoming and they say, God, you got the greatest state on the union. Ladies and gentlemen, there's 30 pipelines that cross Wyoming. They do. 
and they, there's a little stick about every mile or two that's where they can check the line. So uh, that the, if, if, if he had approved the pipeline, which they did once, and then Kerry got, and I know John, I worked with John on many, and then the State Department said yes, and then they said no, and they never did the pipeline, now it will be done, and it means about 3,500 jobs for Rich Trumpka's union. I don't know, but so when you have a party that lost its course with the Lunch Bucket Society, they got work to do. That's my thought, sick as it is. <laughs> um, okay, let's go to some audience questions. I wanna say two things about that. Um, uh, please keep your questions brief. I once heard somebody say that in Berkeley, the definition of a question is a lengthy statement followed by an implied question, am I right? Uh, let's, let's, um, let's try to keep it to questions. Uh, we wanna hear what Senator Simpson has to say. And the second thing is we are recording this uh, for uh, a later webcast, so we have two microphones that are gonna come around as I call on people. Please wait for those microphones so that we can record your question as well as the answer. So we'll start with this gentleman just, right here. Just a second, yeah. there's people back there who are related to my wife. And I don't want to have any questions out of Max and, <laughs> and John and Bruce and Deb. Well, you do I, know I, that I, Debbie, Debbie and that lovely lady in the yellow was the head of the fundraising department of the University of California. Well, Is thank that right, you for Deb? your work. <laughs> Not quite head of it. But... We, we just gave you a promotion. We'll call you the head of it. <laughs> We'll and then there are some buddies from the Bohemian Grove, and you don't want to know who all those wonderful people are. Go ahead. Go ahead, Go ahead sir. Anything. Senator Simpson, the Congress of the United States, the Senate, and other federal institutions were made 100, 200 years ago. The world has changed dramatically. Climate, demographics, political, and so on and so forth. Besides personalities and besides parties, is it realistic without deep institutional reforms to get anywhere? Okay, could, so do, I, do, I, I really do we need, those. sure, do we need institutional changes to Congress? In addition to people getting along better, knowing each other, being friendlier, are there, are there structural or institutional changes that we need to the federal government to Congress to the executive branch? Well, uh, yeah, but it would be so tough to do because it's so built in and ingrained. Uh, uh, when I taught at Harvard, I, I had John Kenneth Galbraith come to my class every year and he'd get up and say, Simpson and I don't see eye to eye on anything until we stand up because he was 6'8 and I was 6'7. <laughs> and he, he they, a, a student said, What's the difference between when you first testified in 1936 and now in 2001 or whatever it was? Oh, he said, all the difference in the world. Uh, the congressperson was known as uh, the chairman as Mr. Cotton, Mr. Railroad, uh, Mr. Wheat, <laughs> Mr. Corn, Mr. Tobacco. That was our sole function, just to be there in Congress without any media around at all. Just sitting there with a big cigar and a, and a bourbon saying, got to get the cotton money and going to do the railroad money. And that was it. And he said, nowadays, he said, I'm so proud of the Congress. Didn't matter what party, because they do have staff, but they have too many. The, the staff have overwhelmed the system. That's the biggest institutional change. And when I got there, uh, Kennedy came to me and he said, now I have a professional staff. They're not Democrats, they, they are Democrats, but they're not working for the party. They're professional staff to help the Judiciary Committee. And I'd like them to visit with you if you want to visit with them and tell you how I run the committee. I said, great, I ran a Judiciary Committee when I was in the Wyoming House. And so he assigned three people to me, very interesting people, who went on to interesting things. Steve Breyer, David Boyce, and Ken Feinberg. That's <laughs> and quite a I staff. tell you, there are three guys that can teach you a lot about government. Sure, they're Democrats, but they sure as hell know the system. And so that was part of my bringing up. But the institution 
will, will not change. Uh, what has to change is the ghastly situation of money raising among the members of Congress, where I will put you on the committee you like if you will cough up, you know, out of your campaign money about 20 grand. And they, at least Republicans do this. I don't know what the other side does, but that is sick. Because you're buying your way right in your own party. Uh, and then if you don't contribute when the campaign comes up to the Congressional Campaign Committee or the Senate, then you get a black mark right there. And then you, when you run, they might not give you much money at all. And you don't want to run that risk, so you play ball. Uh, it's all about money. If we can get a handle on the 28th Amendment, I'm telling you, it could change everything. It would, it would put it up to the states without injuring the First Amendment, but institutional change in Congress, pick one, uh, the filibuster. Uh, that was not a nuclear option, it was a sparrow belch option. <laughs> that had nothing to do with the nuclear. It had never been done before. And if it had been used, how the hell did Clarence Thomas ever got through? The vote was 50, 52 to 48. So when Schumer, who, this is personal, I worked with him on many things. He helped me with the immigration bill on agricultural stuff, I know that. When he, when he came to the Senate, he said, let's start filibustering lower court appointments because they were stiffing him to get to 60 votes. Schumer now, uh, is a, he was a great legislator, but now he's beholden to the base. And it's frustrating for him because he's the guy that brought up filibustering of judges. None of, it, not, nothing happened. He wasn't there during the Thomas hearings, but he, that's his idea. Well, the classic example there of the old phrase, hoist on his own petard blown up by your own bomb. He must have been sitting there watching that last procedure with a lump in his throat like a hockey puck because it's over, but it was never before. And now they're going back right where they, where they were before. There was nothing, there was never a filibuster before to be destroyed. And they destroyed it here. They didn't have to, because it's an automatic butt kicking machine. When you're in the minority, you love it. When you're in the majority, you hate it. And now, bang, this let's, gentleman here. Let's have a young man right here in the middle. Um, Daniela, do you want this to gentleman bring here. Mike? Yeah, this gentleman right I'll here. Uh, hi, Senator Simpson. Uh, my name is Tenzin, and I'm, I'm a Tibetan. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, uh, it's, since it's related to America, You'll um, have to I wanted to You'll get have. on to the foreign policy. So Tibet has uh, have have been uh, under China for at least f uh, since 1959. And in 2010, a Tunisian street vendor has actually self formulated and it has actually uh, sparked the world and got so much attention. But in Tibet, since 2009, 148 Tibetans have self immolated calling for freedom in Tibet and the return of His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama to Tibet. So can I ask so you it's, it's question just, sort of? So since United States is the moral conscience of the world, so in this day and age, is money and national interests are the only factors that world leaders to act on? So the question is, it was specifically about Tibet, but, but was also broader than that. Is should the United States base its foreign policy on, on moral concerns? Uh, or should it be based on, on um, well, should it be based on moral concerns or should it be based only on uh, concerns of interest, whether economic or strategic? Um, he was asking specifically with regard to uh, the United States policy toward China and its policy toward Tibet. But I'm going to broaden the question and sort of ask, what's the, what should be the basis of American foreign policy? Is it just to pursue our interests or is it to pursue moral uh, good? Well, that is a, a great question. I'm sorry I don't respond when you're speaking because I, I can't, I don't hear well. But let me tell you what happened with the Iraq study group so you understand this, this will answer your question. 
Somebody came and testified before our group, and, and don't forget, five Democrats and five Republicans agreed on every word of that package. Great people, Lee Hamilton, Chuck Robb, Leon Panetta, Sandra Day O'Connor, me. Great person, of course. <laughs> uh, they said, a guy came in, he said, you people are missing the boat. Think of Iraq like a man in a, in a coma. And you wake him up, and he smiles and says thanks, and you say, we got a great thing for you. It's called democracy. And he says, I want water. I want food. I mean, give it up. There's never been a democracy like ours. It was started by a bunch of slave owners who drank booze at night and fought all day long and strung this thing together. You're never going to find it anywhere, not in a country with 15 different tribes like to chop each other's toenails off in between resting. We don't even know, understand it. We don't have any concept of it. So uh, our foreign policy, if you're going to go out and democratize the world, forget it. It's impossible, it can't possibly work. Uh, and, and the turmoil in Britain and France and people rising and, and Brexit and, uh, and Greece can't pay on its debt. I mean, uh, Tibet and China, I've watched for years, we've been to that area of the world. It's the saddest thing in the world how they, how they treat that country and yet we don't want to. And now Trump is cozying up to China. And he like it. Why not? He's saying, hey, pal, North Korea could blow your butt further off the world than it could us. So I think you ought to wake up and smell the coffee. And he is. That is, he's hearing that. Because this North Korea, you, you don't ask me where that's going, but this guy, he's not messing around with rigging up something like Cape Cavernall that, you know, whatever, it needs tubes. He's got solid fuel stuff. He just plants something on the tip of it and fire that baby. So I think that China now, it, we're not talking about them manipulating the currency. We're not giving that one up. We're not talking about loosening trade. We're going to give that up. Uh, you don't kill people you trade with. You want to make money off them. So I just think you're going to find a, a whole new game. Uh, uh, with uh, with uh, China, and we'll be on their side, which will be the total irritant for any Tibetan, uh, and sad, and real, and unsolvable, <laughs> while we're trying to kiss up to them, which we're surely doing now. So it's a disheartening thing. I've met the Dalai Lama. He's a marvelous man. Tells a good story, too. Very humorous, very lovely, very dear. But I, I, I maybe not answering your question at all, but... What was it, something like that? Or? <laughs> you answered it, I think. Let's do one more audience question, and uh, then I'm going to award myself the last well, question. Well, we how, how about this gent uh, right here? He was, that guy right there, he's, he's OK, right. all right, we'll, we'll, go, was, we'll go over here. He then, was to this, here nearly fainted. <laughs> to this gentleman right here. No, I right don't want to hear your Right question. here. And I'll have, I'll have we stick around in a minute. We're, we're going to have a little reception after oh, okay. this, so you'll well, be able to talk to the well, I'll need a this drink after this. One. Yes, go ahead. This will be a short one. I got a kick out of the title of your book about a lifetime scrapping with the press. And I'd like you to speculate as to if you were still politically active and given the much greater degree of polarization in the press today, what would your re relations with the press be like now? if you were still politically active. The, the title of his book, by the way, in case you don't know, was Right in the Old Gazoo. <laughs> if, you, if you don't know what gazoo is, look it up on your phone. But anyway. I tell you, the relationship, I think, would be the same. Because I had a rule. When they're after your ass, answer the phone. So I would get my foot in it. And I said once, you remember Peter Arnett? Yeah. Well, I said, Peter Arnett is a sympathizer of North Korea. Oh. The do-gooders and the clean-cut people said, you barbaric slob, you, how could you possibly talk about Peter Arnett? Well, I said, I just was in the military for a couple of years, and I wondered how come he was the only guy that was able to stay in Baghdad while CBS left and NBC left and ABC left and every other damn butt except him. 
And down at the bottom it said, uh, he's under the most difficult circumstances, i.e. he is being censored. Every word coming out of his mouth is on thanks to Saddam, to Saddam Hussein. So they tore me to bits. And so they, I remember Al Hunt, he called, he said, Simpson, you crazy bat, what, what have you said? I said, I said he was a sympathizer. Oh, God, he's a great American. I said, well, not in my mind. Well, guess what happened to him? He, he later then went to another outlet, and then he was fired. And he went to Britain and joined a left-wing paper. And, and guess what? Then I got a call from the New York Times, the Washington Post. Well, what do you have to say about Peter Arnett? You know, he fell from grace. Well, I said, I, I heard that. Well, I said, what did he say? He said he was very hurt and disappointed and sorry that this had occurred and felt badly about it. I said, just take his name out and put my name in. <laughs> no, 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 we want to know how you feel. I said, no, you don't. You, you see him down now, but he was, the, he was the toast of the town for you while you're plowing the ground with me. And now you want me to throw a pay, spade of dirt in his, on his face. And I said, stick it. Amen. And that was interesting. From then on, I always had this rule, when they're after your ass, answer the phone, and, I'm, and not sit with your staff and learn how to spin an issue and say, I made a stupid mistake. I said that, but I don't believe it's stupid. I had another rule, uh, be, a, be accessible to them. Uh, but you can't imagine the, the, the boredom of sitting with a reporter, usually brand new, who are asking you questions about nuclear energy, and you know what their bias is in five minutes. And they're asking you all these questions, and I say, why don't you just say you hate nuclear energy, <laughs> and you wonder why I even think of it, which makes me a Neanderthal. But the point is, there were great journalists, but the worst part of the situation today, and Ethan and I have talked about it, the media and politics are on the lowest rung of society, and that's deadly for, for democracy or any government. They, they know the politician's going to smoke them, have his staff give a bunch of crap, and then the politician knows that the guys try to set him up for a big turkey shot. And, and so there's no trust, and you used to be able to sit with the with great journalists and talk uh, uh, about your bills and stuff and without knowing it, it would come out, you know, that you, it's all distorted and twisted. So we really have a, a problem in domestically with politicians and journalists being in the lowest rung of society. And Trump is certainly adding to that by, you know, fake news and you're the fake news guy. and and they hate him, and he hates them, and, you know. So, so that leads in the, the last question that I'm awarding to myself, and then there will be a reception outside, so you can mm -hmm. talk to the senator if you haven't had a chance to ask your question. So here's my last question. You spent your life in public service. We've been talking about a lot of negative things today. Congress, members of Congress don't get along. Uh, the press doesn't work very well. Social security might go broke, lots of negative things. But you spent your life committed to public service. What gives you hope about the future of the country and the future of our ability to make public policy and govern ourselves? What's, what's the positive thing that you look at going forward? Well, I think that Annie can answer that question, but I think you want to get involved. It won't help you to carry a sign around much longer unless, you're, unless you like that. So do something. Uh, uh, get involved, run for the, get out, go for, run for the school board, student senate, but I'll tell you what I mean is from the heart because Ann and I now are again the precinct committee woman of District 25-1 in Park County. We did that when we were 26 because suddenly our party was taken over by some zanies. They, some of them were Tea Party, some weren't. Many of them are still mad that Trump is elected because they wanted Cruz. So we have to gather them together and 
visit with them about uh, life in the far west. So, <laughs> and, and, and then this one woman got up at the state, at the convention, she said, don't forget another thing, the sole purpose of marriage is for procreation. <laughs> and she held herself to a stalwart position. I waited, I didn't come at her then, I waited to the end, I said, now if any of you believe what this remarkable person has said, uh, you're missing a hell of a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> and she fell on her shriveled breasts into, <laughs> into, into her cups, uh, but honest to God, so we now, we took them out. Uh, should, we, should we be spending time at 85 being precinct? And the answer is yes, because we can do something, and so can you. You can go to your party headquarters or your green party or whatever party you're in and say, how do I get into the game on the lowest level? Don't say you want to be governor first. <laughs> Give that up. And you go to the lowest level of society, the amoebas, and get yourself in the game and work your way up the system. And that works. And it's the only way it'll work. And the other worse result is the tipping point will come and Social Security people will go to the window, they'll be so pissed off, they will see that Medicare isn't there 100%, it's only there 83%, they will see the highways are deteriorating, and they're gonna say, who, who did this? Who was in office when all these signals went up and they never responded? And if they're still there, they'll be taken out. That's your hope. They're gonna say, you lied. You didn't do a lick, and you can read and write, and you knew where these systems were going. And so, pal, now that I'm suffering, you're going to suffer too. So that's the worst result, but that will come. That will come when people say, were you there? And they'll say, well, they'll say they weren't, but you can look them up and find that they were, and they knew all these figures and did nothing. So before you all go out and run for committee precinct person, which you should, I hope you'll join us. If you go out that door and turn to the right, there'll be some food and refreshments. You can stay, have something to eat, chat with Senator and Mrs. Simpson. Please join me in thanking Congresswoman Matsui and Senator Simpson. <laughs>